Good morning. I'm glad to see all of you this morning. Uh, we are continuing our study in the book of James. We are in chapter 2. We uh, went over verses 14 through 17 last time and came to the statement that James is uh, fashioning his premise upon, which is, in the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. Faith without works is dead, or faith without deeds is dead. And this is the uh, primary uh, proposition that James is putting forth to us. And now he is going to uh, use different arguments to help us understand that this is true. And we're going to cover a couple of those this morning before moving on. So we're going to continue to talk about the relationship of faith and action. And uh, that will take care of today's discussion as well as tomorrow's. So I just want to read to you for a little context this verses 14 through 17, and then we'll proceed with uh, verses 18 through 20 this morning. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to, ha claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppo suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, Go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish man, you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? So we're going to look at verses 17 through 20, um, start, or on verses 18 through 20. Starting in 18, he says, But someone will say, You have faith, I have deeds. So uh, James is putting forth that um, someone could say, Well, uh, faith and deeds aren't interlinked together, that you can have one and be saved and not have the other and be saved. But again, James said in verse 17 that faith without works is dead. So now he proceeds to develop the argument in support of his proposition. His first point is that works are necessary to prove that a person has faith. One person has faith, another has deeds. The statement then becomes an, ass an assertion that faith and works are not necessarily related to each other and that it is possible to have either one without the other. To this assertion, James, res James responds with the challenge, show me your faith without deeds. The implication is that faith can be demonstrated apart from action. Faith is an attitude of the inner man, and it can only be seen as it influences the actions of the one who possesses it. Mere profession of faith proves nothing as to its reality. Only action can demonstrate faith's genuineness. So James declares, I will show you my faith by what I do. Now the second argument offered in support of the preposition stated in verse 17 that faith without works is dead, concerns the nature of saving faith. Now let's go back and look at verse 19. Verse 19, he says, uh, You believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. Now it's interesting uh, the context that James is uh, using here. Um, all faithful Jews believe the creed known as the Shema, which is found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, where uh, Moses says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. James commends his, good, his Jewish Christian readers for believing that there is one God. He said, this is good, that God is one, was a basic truth of Jew Jewish orthodoxy. But such acceptance of a creed is not enough to save a person. To prove his point, James declares that even demons believe the Shema. 
They know that there is but one God, and as a result, they shudder. The Greek term phryso describes a shudder that results from fear. That the demons so respond to the fact is evidence that their belief is a thorough conviction. However, their response is also evidence that their faith is not a saving faith, for they are terrified at the thought of God. Belief has not brought them peace. Saving faith, then, is not mere intellectual acceptance of a theological proposition. It goes much deeper, involving the whole inner man and expressing itself outwardly in a changed life. And, you know, I've always marveled at this verse that even the demons uh, believe in God and shudder. Um, I had never uh, put that together with the Jewish Shema, Hero Israel, the the Lord our God, the Lord the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Um, it isn't, and a lot of people say they believe in God, but it isn't enough just to say that you believe in God. Your your life has to be changed in your faith in order to have a saving relationship with God. Of course, we have to have the blood of Christ to cover our sins, but in response to our faith in God, in our response to the gift given to us uh, by, by Christ's sacrifice, our lives have to demonstrate a change, uh, a change um, that results in a turning away from sin, what we call repentance, doing a 180 to actually turn the other direction and go the other way. That's the idea here. Now, James is going to introduce the next argument in support of faith without works is dead with the question, do you want evidence in verse 20? His manner of addressing his imagined opponent is blunt to say the least. The least He calls the man foolish. The Greek adjective translated foolish means empty. It refers to a deficiency that is intellectual. He's calling the guy dumb. But in the theological and moral context of the New Testament, it also has a moral and spiritual flavor. So James addresses his opponent as one who has no comprehension of spiritual truth. The guy is spiritually inept or spiritually dumb. He does not see that faith without deeds is useless. In verse 17, such faith is called dead. Here it is described as something that does not work, which is arge. It accomplishes nothing. The Greek word is arge, uh, meaning it accomplishes nothing. The evidence that James uses his, or offers his opponent is found in verses 21 through 25 and consists of two Old Testament examples, Father Abraham and the prostitute Rahab. And we will talk about those two examples next time. Um, on our prayer list this morning, we have Jerry and Craig and Elena. Um, Jerry and Craig are both recovering from uh, procedures, and Elena is a young girl dealing with uh, incredible headaches. And uh, due to the coronavirus, it's uh, hard for her to get treatment at this time. So um, you can just imagine what that's like for a young girl having to deal with extreme headaches and not be able to do anything about it until this thing blows over. So we just need to ask God for his patience and his comfort during this time and that her headaches won't, won't be uh, too much to bear. So let's pray to God. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we've uh, shared together. Um, we just pray, Father, that you would continue to bless our friends Jerry and Craig as, as they uh, recover from the surgical procedures that they have. We just ask, Father, for complete healing. We ask, Lord, that uh, you would give both of them patience as they continue to uh, to mend. And, and Father, we just pray that you would help both of them be uh, cancer-free and that the doctors would, would be able to find a course of treatment that, that would uh, give them that very thing, a uh, cancer-free diagnosis. And Father, we pray for Elena this morning that, that you would provide her with comfort and that you would help 
her get relief from these headaches that she's having and that treatment would be available to her just as soon as possible. And Father, again, we, we want to just continue to praise you for our brothers and sisters that are serving uh, in the medical field. Uh, there are so many different areas in which people are serving during this time. They're putting their lives at risk for the sake of other people. And Father, I think of that as someone that is showing great faith. And I realize that not all of them are probably believers. But Father, that's the type of action that that you would call us to have in response to our faith, that we would have this great message of the gospel and it would be a burden upon us to share that message with everyone and anyone who would listen. Father, I just want to thank you again for this time and I'll pray a blessing on all those that are listening this morning and those that couldn't join us. I just ask, Father, that you would bless their lives and give them peace. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Thank you for joining me this morning.